This episode of Reason Africa was made possible by our fans on Patreon. If you would like to support us to keep producing quality content on a more regular basis, please consider supporting our channel on patreon.com slash Reason Africa. Over the years, neocolonialism has manifested itself in Africa in several different domains, which include political, economic, and social cultural systems, such as military takeovers and even balance of trade, and the dependence of countries on their former colonial masters. But the overall picture after the Second World War and post-war debt is that besides a wave of pro-independence movements, European possessions in Africa were becoming too expensive to continue exploiting profitably, and one by one, the Europeans started leaving. The Italians left, the Portuguese left, the British left, the Spanish, even though to this day they refuse to leave northern Morocco, which is a story for another day, which leaves us with the French. Well, the French never left. I'm sure the nature of Europe's relationship with their ex-colonies and the discourse of neocolonialism are debatable. However, don't get me wrong, obviously France technically left their African colonies, but for the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Paris indeed granted them a small degree of autonomy, but the continuous subjugation of the former African colonies never came to an end, keeping a tight rein on them with invisible but deep-seated ties. I'm sure at one point you must have heard the term France Afrique. With two contrasting aspects, one French, the other African, France Afrique is the ultimate symbol that perfectly illustrates France's vehement refusal to decolonize in sub-Saharan Africa. The doctrine refers to France's entangled patronage with its former empire that allowed the Fifth Republic to maintain their grip on Africa, therefore nullifying their independence through neocolonial schemes. Nowhere is France Afrique more alive than in Niger, the former French colony with a land area of 1.2 million square kilometers is the largest country in West Africa, but about 80% of the land lies within the Sahara Desert. Because of this, it was nicknamed the frying pan of the world because it is one of the hottest countries in the world. Sad to say that it is no secret that according to the World Bank, this is one of the poorest countries in the world. With a per capita income of only 480 US dollars, in 2016 it ranked 187 out of 188 countries on the United Nations Human Development Index. With a population of 25 million, more than 60% of its population survives on less than $5 a day and the average life expectancy is only 45 years. So what are the possible factors behind Niger's underdevelopment? There are several reasons which international organizations refer to as the prime causes of poverty here. But all these factors represent only one side of the coin. There is something beyond the innumerable indicators of chronic poverty that gives worldwide attention to this country. Also known as the uranium capital of Africa, Niger is the world's fourth largest producer of uranium ore. It provides 7.5% of the world's mining output from Africa's highest grade uranium ores, according to the World Nuclear Association. But as the usual narrative goes, uranium represents around 80% of the country's exports, but contributes only 5% to the national GDP. Far away from Nigerian territory, over 3,000 kilometers away, People live a sumptuous life in the cities of France. Remember the other side of the coin I talked about? France sits squarely on top of it. Uranium is arguably the most strategic commodity for France and since its discovery in Niger, a major chunk of the ore has been exclusively exported to France for over 50 years by Arriva, the massive state-owned nuclear power company of France. 
You see, more than 75% of electricity produced in France comes from nuclear power and most of the uranium used for nuclear combustion here is supplied by a river. Up to four in five light bulbs in France are lit up thanks to the Nigerian uranium. While Niger's uranium lights the Eiffel Tower, including one third of households in France, add to that, propping up France's nuclear superpower status, the people of Alit and Akonan, popularly known as the twin mining towns in Niger, the real owners of this valuable wealth, are living in squalor. Many people don't even know that the impoverished mining towns of Niger are keeping the lights on in France. But the situation in Niger is just the reverse, where only 10 to 20 percent of people in urban areas have access to electricity. Let me explain. The interest of France in Niger dates back to the colonial era. However, the discovery of untapped uranium reserves in the country further reinforced that interest. When France began mining uranium ore in the deserts of northern Niger in the early 1970s, they promised to build a little Paris in the country. However, till this day, the mining towns remain dusty and neglected, scoured by desert sandstorms and barely touched by the mineral wealth it ships off to Europe each year. The French embraced nuclear power to free itself from over-reliance on foreign oil and just like that, this remote corner of Africa became a linchpin to French national interests. Though Niger got its independence in 1960, France still plays an influential role in the country, thereby playing an invincible to the naked eye monopoly game to tap its natural resources. It is France that gets the real benefit of uranium ore in Niger by reinforcing the Franco-African policy in the continent. Here is how. Niger's government has been demanding a better deal from Paris and specifically from state-owned nuclear company Arriva. The two sides began talking more than six years ago but arrived at an agreement that still places Niger under France's thumb. In 2014, Niger announced it had successfully renegotiated uranium extraction contracts with Arriva to secure a greater share of the wealth deriving from their resources. Years later, there are still calls into question the benefits for Niger in the new contract. Arriva and Niger's expired agreements had never been made public. The country's newly elected president said that the deals are a throwback to the post-colonial era where France played a dominant role in the economies of its former African territories. The government wants to cut the tax breaks and raise the royalty rate, its largest source of income from the mines, to as much as 15%. That would be more than the 5% charged by most Australian states, but bring Niger into line with the 13% charged by Canada's uranium-producing province of Saskatchewan over the past decade. In Kazakhstan, the official rate is 18.5%. Arriva produces uranium in both Canada and Kazakhstan but would not detail the royalties it pays in those countries, according to the company, which produced nearly one-fifth of the world's uranium in 2015, a higher royalty rate would make its business in Niger unprofitable. With global revenues of $15 billion in 2019, the French farm is almost twice as big as Niger's entire economy, according to the IMF. For four decades, Arriva never provided a profit breakdown for its operations in Niger, but always insisted the deals with the country were fair. However, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, a global coalition of governments including Niger's and of companies seeking to improve the accountability of natural resource revenues, estimates a river's mines revenues to be exorbitantly more. The latest transparency report shows Arriva received a range of tax breaks and benefits, some of which were standard under Niger's 1999 mining law.
signed in 2001 and effective for 20 years from January 1st, 2004, the contract states that Arriva was exempt from any export duties on its uranium production, exempt from all entry taxes, custom duties and value-added tax on materials, equipment, machine parts and petroleum products used in mining operations, protected by a stability clause so that an increase in royalties tax under a new 2006 mining law did not affect them, protected so that if another uranium miner negotiated better terms, a river would automatically benefit from the same conditions, guaranteed that any audit of the mines ordered by Niger will remain strictly confidential, and finally granted an exemption of up to 20% of corporate income tax to help fund future prospecting of more mines. As far as contracts go, this one was ruthless. Thousands of protesters from all over Niger recently parked the streets of the capital Niamey to demonstrate against the giant farm Arriva and demanded that the company pay more taxes to ensure the country benefits more from uranium sales. In June 2014, a strategic partnership agreement signed between Arriva and Niger stressed that Arriva would be subject to the legal royalty regime, raising hopes of a fairer share of revenues for Niger. In 2016, Arriva released for the first time the payments the company makes to governments where it mines uranium as part of new European Union regulations. In Niger, it was the first time the public had access to Arriva's payments since the renegotiation took place and the results was surprising. As numerous reports previously documented how uneven the partnership was, one would have expected the French company to pay a higher amount of royalty fees. However, one would be wrong. In the five years following the new deal, Arriva's royalty payments decreased by $5.3 million. So what went wrong? How did the royalties reduce after all the trouble of renegotiating the contract? To answer this question, we first need to take a step back and look at how the royalty regime works in Niger. The country uses a sliding scale royalty regime, which means that the royalty rate increases with the profitability of the company. According to Arriva's payments to government report, the extraction price of uranium extracted from Nigerian mines fell by almost $40 per kilogram of uranium. The effect of a price decrease is in two ways. First, the lower value of the uranium, the gross revenues generated by the mines are smaller, which means the royalty fee, a fraction of the gross revenues, is also smaller. And second, with a lower value of the uranium, the profits of the mines are less important, which means the profitability of the mine is lower and the applicable royalty rate is the lowest one possible. This rather complicated formula essentially means that the extraction price is to be indexed in both short-term market prices and long-term market prices. Indexing the extraction price on market prices therefore lowered the value of uranium in the country. The problem here is that Arriva is not operating on short-term contracts. Uranium extracted here is systematically sold to another subsidiary of the Arriva group to be refined into nuclear fuel. The nuclear fuel is provided to Arriva's commercial partners, mostly on long-term contracts. For example, Electricité de France has signed a contract with Arriva to secure a supply of 30,000 tons of uranium until 2035. The incredible decrease in price means that revenues to the Nigerian economy will also sharply decrease. But did Arriva shoot itself in the foot? Does a decrease in price benefit the company? Obviously, a decrease in a mineral's price would not appear to benefit a mining company. Usually, the lower the price, the lower the profits. However, in this case, it does in fact benefit a river because of the way the company structures its activities in Niger. 
To formally get ownership over the uranium extracted in the mines, Arriva has to buy the uranium at extraction price. The company then buys this uranium through its Nigerian branch before selling it to another subsidiary that will take care of refining the ore. The Arriva is therefore not only a seller but also a buyer. It has an incentive to export uranium at a cheaper price. The cheaper the uranium is, the better for the company that can refine and sell nuclear fuel at a lower price than competition. Is this underhanded? Definitely. Is it complicated? Maybe. But there is no doubt or confusion that Niger is still being pillaged by France. In the northern part of the country, pastoralist communities like the ethnic Tuareg have survived on their livestock for generations. But the present generation of Tuareg are not as fortunate as their forefathers. The air, water and land are polluted and the animals are constantly falling sick due to their grazing pastures being contaminated with radioactive dust. In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency sets limits on emissions from dumps and monitors them on a regular basis. Unfortunately, this does not happen in many less developed countries across Africa. For Arriva, polluting Niger is cheaper than polluting France. The true cost of the pollution created by the company is unclear and may run into billions of dollars. The main sticking point, though, is that despite vast resources in uranium, Niger has yet to convert this valuable resource into tangible wealth. As always, guys, our desire to inspire a passion for learning about Africa runs deep. If you'd like to have a better understanding of Africa, start now by subscribing and you'll be on your way. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.